take a lesson for the day. Just a little survey. How many of you have ever read the book of Ephesians chapter 6 before? How many of you read it before? So this, this won't be a concept that uh, you haven't heard of before. But for those of you that have not, we pray that the sermon will be a guide for your understanding of what is going on in the life of the church in particular, for what's going on right now in our country in general. If you do not have an understanding of Ephesians chapter 6, you will be very confused about what is going on. This is why it's so important to not only be a hearer of the word and a reader of the word, but also a doer of the word. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. So for those of you who have not raised your hand, Ephesians chapter 6, we need to be reread this afternoon. Then we're going to come back on the Wednesday for Bible study so that we dig a little deeper into this text. You will get a better understanding of what's going on in the church in particular, but also in our country in general. We heard this evening. I'm going to read verse 10, and then we'll take time and go over verses 10 through 20 in the message. Verse 10 says, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord in his vast strength. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand. That's the sign right there. So that you can stand. Now Paul's writing this to the church. So he wouldn't tell the church not to pray for him. But he was wanting them to know that why are you praying for me? You need to make sure the devil ain't in your prayer. A lot of folks tell you they're praying for you. They still have the devil in them, so you can't have everybody praying for you. Amen. I ain't saying church don't pray for the pastor. Like I said, I'm praying for that. Well, I don't need everybody praying for me. Because you got some devils in you you can't see. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, put on the whole armor of God. You may be seated. Amen. God has called the church to be prepared to fight against spiritual warfare. Everybody say spiritual warfare. Amen. Today's message is about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is the struggle against the forces of evil, which is constant feature in the life of faith. It's a constant theme in the life of the believer. It's a constant issue for us as followers of Christ. We will not ever have a phase of our journey that is completely free of the dangers of spiritual warfare. So for those of us who are looking to be free and above sin, the only thing that you can do is find you an apartment somewhere downtown Greenville just above a liquor store and a whole house where the landlord won't charge you any rent. That's the only way that you're going to be free and above sin because spiritual warfare is everywhere. Just they say it's everywhere. Anyway, there's nowhere we can go as a believer in this universe that is free from the attacks of evil, the forces of of evil are everywhere and we have the victory through Christ Jesus to be able to combat the forces of evil with the power of God living on the inside of us. So this is a constant issue that we're going to face as believers. We're going to embattle spiritual warfare. Scripture locates the origins of spiritual warfare in the rebellion of Satan and his angels against God and affirms the hope of God's final victory over the forces through Christ death and resurrection. So Jesus already defeated the penalty of sin at Calvary when he died on the cross and when he rose on the third day and said all power 
is in his hands. He actually had a victory over the penalty of sin and being able to have uh, the power to steal, um, to take away the power of the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy our souls. And the battle that continues is, is the battle of the forces of evil in trying to hinder the witness of the church. That's where we need to, to register in our minds where the witness of the church is still under attack and has been under attack by the forces of evil for some 2,000 years. This is why it is so important for us to live lives that are pleasing unto God but also inspirational unto others. Many of us have one part figured out but we are needing some work in another area. We understand the importance of having an all-seeing and an all-knowing God. We don't have to fake or to fool anybody. We know that God is always watching us and so living a life that is pleasing unto God is something that most believers can readily understand. But the other part of our journey that where we lack sincerity is lacking the ability to understand the importance of being an inspiration unto others. I, I watch the old mothers of the church who didn't really have much education, didn't really have much of anything, but they always came in to the worship experience with a smile on their face. They, they always had a word from the Lord for me. They didn't have maybe a third or fourth grade education. They didn't have a lot of money in the bank, but they had the joy of the Lord that was their strength. Anybody remember the old mothers that always had a word from the Lord for you? They were enduring the hardships of racism and sexism. They were enduring having to pray for sons and daughters who were wayward and who had gone astray, but that did not stop them from praying and trusting in the word of God and being steadfast, unmoved, always abounding in the word of the Lord. That was inspirational to me because being a young man growing up in the church, I always thought that they talked about God all the time, but as I got a little older, I, I got a little more mature, they were able to tell me about some of the struggles they had on their journey. They were able to tell me about some disappointments they had gone through, even while they still kept on, kept it on. And what I told them when I was sitting down with them is that, is that, is that, is that Mother Makers, you inspired me. And Mother Cheryl, you inspired me because if it had not been for the smiles on your face back then, I might not have had the ability to keep on keeping on right now. Somebody here needs to be inspired because the attacks of the enemy had weighed down on your consciousness. The attacks of the forces of evil have discouraged your witness to tell people about the goodness of the Lord. The attacks of the enemy have almost led you to throwing in the towel and giving up on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today's message is about spiritual warfare. Everybody say spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not always the root cause of every bad thing that happens in our life. Sometimes we give the devil too much credit. When you stay up all night long and you eat them hot wings and that pizza and that barbecue pork sandwich at 1230 at night and the next morning your stomach hurt, you don't even say the devil messes with my stomach. You ate too much food late at night. When you ate some eight day old collard greens, don't be blaming that on the enemy. That has to do with a lack of taking care of your body. And we want to begin to blame other stuff on the devil. So it touched them and said, it ain't all the devil. So when we look at what spiritual warfare really is, if your focus is on pleasing God, and if your intent is to inspire others, watch how the devil would turn up the heat on the attacks in your life. As soon as you make up your mind that you're going to live righteously before God and justly before his people, you watch how the devil will begin to turn up the heat. You'll have start having bills come out of nowhere and you'll question whether you need to pay your tithes. You'll start having friends who have been longtime friends to turn their back on you. You'll start having folk in the church to make up rumors about you because you ain't giving them nothing to talk about. Come on somebody. You, 
you start having people pick at you for no reason at all and you ask yourself, God, where is all of this coming from? And the answer is not because you've done anything wrong. The answer is not because you have mistreated someone. The answer is, is that this is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare often intensifies and escalates as the church strives for a deeper commitment to share the gospel. When the church makes up its mind that it's going to win souls for the kingdom, that's when spiritual warfare escalates. When the church makes up its mind that it's going to live for Jesus and nobody else, that's when spiritual warfare kicks in. That's where we have the trials of life that come, and they come not to destroy the church, but to make us strong so that we understand that we are encouraged to go with Jesus all the way. We should not complain about the attacks of the enemy when we know that they are certain to come. This is why Ephesians 6 is so important. This is why we are studying the word of God to understand what the tactics and the schemes of the devil are. Ladies, when you get that phone call or that text at 2 o'clock in the morning saying he just want to talk, guess what? He don't want to just talk. We should not be surprised by the attacks of the enemy. When we're prepared to fight the enemy with the whole arm of God. Just maybe say the whole arm of God. So, so I, I know you're saved. I know you're on your way to heaven anyhow. I know God ain't through with you yet. But guess what? The devil ain't through with you either. He, 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 he can put on a three-piece suit. Yes, sir. Yes, he can. He, he, he can put on some red four-inch high heels. Yes, he can. He can wear a long dress or he can wear a short dress. The devil can come in any form where he think he can get right out to you and what you are looking for and what you like. Don't expect the devil to come into church ladies looking like Anton from In Living Color. Don't expect him to come in looking like Whoopi Goldberg, man. He's going to come in looking like what you're looking for so that he can go after what you're like. And the problem for most of us is, is it's hard for us to get rid of an enemy that we like. Your issue may not be your neighbor's issue, but your devil knows what your issue is. See, all of us have an angel that has been dispatched to watch over us and protect us from being seen and unseen, but all of us got a devil too. See, a third of those that were in heaven with God were cast down with Satan. And until the battle in Revelations comes into fruition, they're still roaming around the universe somewhere. And they're going after not the raggedy people, the folk who don't care about God. They're going after the church so that they can hinder our witness. They're looking for a reason for you to throw in a towel. They're looking for a reason to agitate you and aggravate you. And you've got to be able to have enough courage and enough faith to tell the devil, just like Jesus told Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. So here we are today saying that God has called the church to put on the whole arm of God. The whole arm of God is the spiritual tools that are necessary to overcome spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is going to happen. But not just because it's going to happen that you should be afraid. You ought to be able to be equipped to arm yourself with the tools that Paul has given us so that we can understand how to defeat the enemy. Don't let him rise because he might want to drive. You can't let the devil ride in your car because he might want to drive your car all over the town. You can't let him sleep in your bed because you might wake up the next morning not knowing who you are or where you are. You got to understand that you can't let him win. And when we always focus on the negative things that the enemy is doing without coming back with the enemy with scripture, we are showing the level of immaturity that we have in the word of God. We ought to be able to come back whatever the devil says with the word from the Lord. Touch your neighbor and say, I got a word. 
We cannot always assume that, that the material world is all that we know. Many of us are looking for an animal with horns on his head and a, and a pitchfork in his hand and a, and a, and a pointed tail with, with vampire-like teeth looking for the devil. But the devil can come in many different forms. He can come not only even in a form at all. He can enter into your mind and say things to you that are not of God. He can enter into your soul and try to tell you that you are not who God says you are, but when you understand the power of the word of God, we can speak a word in our spirit before we say it with our mouths, because the very world and the very universe was not formed by the hands of God or God's mystical paintbrush. The world and the universe was formed by the very word of God. How do we know the fact it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. So I don't need a gun to fight the devil. I don't need an axe or a baseball bat to fight the devil. All I need to fight him is the mighty and the matchless moving Word of God. There's a world that we can see. But there's also a world that we cannot see. The visible world has us all captivated and, 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 and concentrated on particular things in our lives. But the world that we can't see is greater than the world that we can't see. And so that we can see. And so in order to be able to handle what the devil brings our way, we have to be rooted and grounded in the word of God. The credibility and the character of our witness will often be challenged, will be attacked, and even compromised. You ever heard old folks say, don't let your good will be ill spoken of? So when you go places late at night and telling people you was witnessing for the church, make sure you don't have a brown paper bag in your hand. When, you, when you're going to the club and telling people you're going there to share the gospel, make sure you ain't on the floor trying to drop it like it's hot. When you're going places and telling people that you're trying to do the will of God, make sure that your lifestyle and your actions are representing a saint and not a sinner because the witness of the church Church, the credibility of the church can always be challenged when the people of God are not living what we're preaching. We can allow, allow the enemy to discredit our witness. We must strive to live lives that are pleasing to God and also inspiration to others. I am encouraged to walk with Jesus all the way. It was a song we sang when I was in college. And the song says, though trials come, they come to make me very strong. It says, I'm going to run on to see what the end is going to be. So sometimes the people that you call friends will turn on you. And you need to say to yourself, spiritual warfare. Sometimes your own family members will, will scandalize your name. You need to say spiritual warfare. And when sometimes even church folks that you thought were praying for you will be praying on you. And you need to say in your soul that ain't nothing but spiritual warfare. It's not the person. It's not the flesh that you see in the natural. It's the spirit that's behind it in the supernatural. And that's why we got to put on the whole arm of God. Paul in this letter as he tells us uh, that we need to recognize that we're in a battle. Christians, uh, we have a, a relationship with God. We, 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 we are connected to God and we belong to Christ, but we also have to have a new attitude towards the devil. The devil is not our friend. So that's why you can't let him ride. Just never say you can't let him ride. The devil ain't your homeboy. That's why you can't hang out with him. And you have to recognize that he is a devious, wicked and ruthless enemy that is seeking to destroy everything that you believe in. He knows he can't have your soul, but he'll try to take your sanity. I'll preach right there for a little bit. He, he knows he can't have your soul, but he'll try to mess with your mind. This is why he's always trying to use psychological invalidation to tell people of God that you're not who God says you are. He's trying to mess with your minds and lead you to misery so you won't have a ministry. I'll say that again. It, 
if you're trying to mess with your mind and lead you to misery so that you won't have a ministry. And if the church ain't got no ministry, souls are not being saved. If the church ain't got no ministry, people are not being delivered from strongholds and spiritual warfare. If the church doesn't have a ministry, the name of God is not being exalted. And when you understand that we're in a war, if we're going to win, we got to not let the devil hinder our witness. There's a spiritual war going on. And this war is being fought between God and Satan in every part of the universe, in earth as it is in heaven. Paul describes different pieces of the Christian armor as though he's equipping a Roman soldier. He may be even chained to a soldier while he's writing this epistle. And so can you imagine the Roman legion as they were going out for battle? They were trained for up to six months before they were ever engaged in battle. And during that six months of, of rigorous training. They had to have uh, careful restrictions on what they ate and what uh, they did. They had to wake up in the morning early and prepare their bodies uh, for warfare. They had to eat to their diet in a way that they would be able to handle the rigors and the clashing and the clamoring uh, of warfare. Their armor was created and designed as such uh, so that when the enemy would shoot fire and darts at them, that they would have a shield and a breastplate and a helmet and a belt of truth and uh, sandals that would allow them to mobilize to and fro while they're in battle. And even while we're in the midst of some political turmoil in America, even while the White House is currently under fire, those of us who know the will of God and the word of God, we can't let the enemy mess with our minds and say, ain't no reason for us to vote in November because Washington is in chaos. We have to understand that at all times, we must put on not part of the armor of God, but the whole armor of God. So the first thing we need to do, church, is we need to be strong in the Lord. Church, next day, be strong in the Lord. And see, this is very important because Paul is closing a letter to the church where in the first five chapters he emphasized the importance of spiritual maturity and Christian unity and he knew that the church had already been having struggles and trials and divisions so he wanted them to understand that they are able to do everything that he's saying that they can do because God is with them. That's why we have to be strong in the Lord because being strong in the Lord does not mean that we won't face calamity. Being strong in the Lord does not mean that we won't face temptation. Being strong in the Lord is being able to understand not only who you are, but whose you are while you are in the midst of trouble. David says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against them. And that's what being strong in the Lord is. Being strong in the Lord is not about trying to stop the flood from coming in. Being strong in the Lord is not about not trying to keep the waters from rising. Being strong in the Lord is simply sometimes about having the courage to hold on to the standard. Is there anybody out there that is sick and tired of all this more relativism that's going on in the world where wrong is right and right is wrong? People don't want to take a stand for anything. I'm wondering, is there anybody in the church that's willing to call sin a sin? Is there anybody in the church that is willing to call right right and wrong wrong? Is there anybody in the house of God that has got the courage to hold on to the standard. Being strong in the Lord sometimes is about having the courage to hold on to the standard. So that word strong comes from the word in duamo, which means to make able, to empower, or to share power. When people are walking in ignorance, church, don't enable them by allowing them to stay in their ignorance. Sometimes you just got to pull somebody to the side and say, my brother, my sister, I don't mean no harm, but, but I don't agree with what you're doing. And, and here's the reason why. You got us to start with the word. The word of God says is to be strong in the Lord and stand against the tactics of the devil. It didn't say 
go party with the devil. It didn't say uh, when you can't beat them, join them. It didn't say when it wrong do as the Romans. It says you got to stand against the wiles of the devil. So why would we, after all these years of suffering slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation, go and join a party that does not have any intentions of being good to our people? Why would we stand with a party that does not have anything good to say about people of color? Why would we participate with a party that has called people out of their name because of the country where they come from? My brothers and sisters, don't have that mentality if you can't beat them, join them. Don't have that mentality when in Rome doing the Romans. You've got to be able to stand for right even when everything around you looks like it's going wrong. Problem is, they don't like we got a lot of strong people. They just lost John McCain, and people talking about Senator McCain because he stood against uh, this president and this presidency, but he knew what he believed in, and he knew what he stood for. He was not going to let uh, this bandwagon mentality suck him in to everything that he had fought for. At least he had the courage uh, to go fight in the war while others was dodging uh, the draft. At least he had the courage uh, to stand up for right even when others weren't supporting him. Uh, at least he had the courage uh, to be strong in the Lord when everybody else was looking weak. So you got to be strong in the Lord. Secondly, you got to be sure of unseen opposition. Just maybe say be sure of unseen opposition. See, every time when you walk in a room and folk is looking at you and whispering over in a corner, it does not mean they're always talking about you. They could be just talking about what they're talking about. And see, most of us, because we are super sensitive, we immediately will say in our mind, when we see them folks whispering and looking over their shoulder at us, we say, hey, what are they talking about me? And we are eating up on the inside. Our whole prayer life is just out of whack because we walked in the room and some folk was in a corner and they either stopped talking when we walked in or they was over there whispering and we thought they was talking about us. Now, I'm not saying they ain't talking about you. But that doesn't always mean they're talking about you. See, what you need to realize, there's some folk talking about you right now that you can't even see. See, Wiles of the devil, tactics of the devil, schemes of the devil are traps that are set beforehand. So in order to set a trap, let me tell you what a hunter has to do. It has to scale the size of the animal. It has to measure the strength of the animal. And once it scales is the size and the strength of the animal, it builds the trap that is customized to catch what it's trying to get. And so you can't get me by offering me a pack of cigarettes after church. I'm just going to tell you right now, that ain't, that ain't no trap for me. You, you can't get me by offering me a fifth of Jack Daniels. That ain't going to get me. But my issue may not be your issue. Your issue might be not my issue. But well, you better believe that the devil got a trap set just to meet you, not in your strength, but in your weakness. And see, you don't go fight an elephant with a toothpick. All you got to do is go throw a rat and the elephant will go running. Because every mighty animal has a weakness. Samson was the mightiest man in Israel, but all he had to do is find a woman that was pretty enough that he could tell all of his secrets and when she cut off all his hair and got him drunk, he couldn't fight a midget. And that's what's wrong with some of us. We focus on our stress, but we forget about our weaknesses. The devil is not after what you can see. He comes after you with what you cannot see. And see that verse 12 paints a clear picture for us. It says, our battle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers and against authorities and against world powers of this darkness and spiritual forces of evil in high places. The King James calls it spiritual witness, principalities, and it comes from the word cosmocrator, which means influence in the lives of worldly people. See, the devil don't always come after the church through the morning worship service. That's too easy. What the devil does is he goes on the television and he puts 
four pictures of eight like creatures. One is little, one's a little bit bigger, one's a little bit bigger, and then he shows a picture of a man and he tells the church, because we don't do it, we watch TV all day, he tells us that we came from monkey. And because they put the bones on the television of the, of the gorilla head and the ape head, and he shows us all these stuff, and then he starts messing with our mind, say, well, maybe that's where we come from. But I want to let you know that I'm like that little girl. If you start believing the truth of, of a monkey, that might be your side of the family, because from my side of the family, I know that I come from God. I know that God created Adam from the dust. He breathed into him the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. You might want to act like a monkey. You might want to show the monkey and cuss people out like a gorilla, but I come from God. And so when he tells me that I'm his own and he walks with me and talks with me. I don't believe no picture I see on the TV screen. I don't believe that I came from an ape like creature. I know that there's nobody about it who somebody says that I am. I know that I'm a child of God. So that unseen opposition that are at work, church, to try to mess with your thinking. So you will think just like the world. This is why the church don't have a word for the Lord like we should have more. This is why when people come in and live in any kind of way, our first position is to condone what they're doing so that we will not be able to stand on the word of God. We want to make folk comfortable in their sin, and that's what's wrong with the world. We have not been called to make people comfortable in their sin. We have come to be like the old mothers and sing their songs and say, Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down. Be sure of unseen opposition. It's not always the enemy that you can see. Be, be prayed up for the enemy that you cannot see. Thirdly, be steadfast in the gospel. Just make say be steadfast. My brothers and sisters, let me show you what this means. After Paul talks about the belt of truth, putting around your waist, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, feet sounded with the gospel of peace, and also having on the helmet of salvation. He does not end with just the defensive weapons. All of the first five that he mentions are things that are meant to protect us, protecting our minds, protecting our hearts, protecting our waist, protecting our feet. And protecting our bodies because the shield that the Romans would use would be an entire body shield. It would not be like the shield of a gladiator. It would be a shield that they could use as a corporate body together. They would join those shields together and they would have a shield in the front that would face the darks of the enemy. But they would also have a shield above them when they would drop the heavy burdens and bombardments above them. And this is why Paul set all of that up. That when we are going out in the this world and in this wicked universe we need to be on the defensive but not totally be defensive we also need to be offensive and he says take the help of the salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and this is bringing me back to the old mothers of the old church where they had a word from the Lord they let the Sunday school do the work for them because they had a word from God they let Bible study do the work for them because they had a word from God they let their personal Personal, the folks in our life do the work for them because they had a word from God and that's what you need because the devil ain't going on vacation y'all he's looking to come after the church every chance he gets he wants you to be comfortable with sin so that you won't take the word and come back sin he wants you to accept the, the chaos that we got going on is normal but you need to say to your neighbor say this is not normal being steadfast in the gospel will keep you focused and be bold, as it says in verse 19, to pray also for me and the message that may be given to me when I open my mouth and make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Uh, just let me say, be bold, neighbor, be bold. The boldness that Paul is talking about comes from the word parousia, which means confidence. It means free to speak. And I'm so glad that the old mother sing those songs that, that says, I'm free, praise the Lord, I'm free, I'm no longer bound, no more chains holding me, my soul is rested, it's just a blessing, praise the Lord, hallelujah, I'm free. As I thought about it, I said, how could they sing a song that their soul is rested? They were still in the flesh. How could they say that they were free when 
we still had racism? How could they say that they were free when we still had sexism? How could they say that we were free and we still had poverty? I didn't understand it then, but once I realized I got a little older and I studied the Word of God, I realized that the Word of God had told them in chapter 5 to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs so that they could be able to face the attacks of the enemy. And so they were not focused on this temporary life that we were living. Their spirits had already made themselves right with God. They knew that they were going to live on in a building that was not made by man's hand. So that's why they were saying songs called I'm Sending Up My Temple because they had heard about the God that had said in my father's house there are many mansions. If it was not so, Jesus said, I would not have told you because I'm going away to prepare a place for you that when I come again, I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be there also. Guess what, church? Jesus is not only the way, he is the only way. And the way that you're going to Make it the way that you're going to move through the miseries of life and still do ministry is you got to be steadfast in the gospel. You got to be reminding yourself every day that I'm saved to serve God. I'm here for a purpose. I'm not here for show and tell. I'm not here for fun and games. I'm not here for pity pat and playing with God. This is a war that we're in and we're going to win. We got to fight not with half the armor, but the whole armor. The Christian spiritual word is the word of God. That's why we got to read the Bible just as it is, basic instructions before leaving earth. We can't take the word lightly because Jesus said the heaven and earth will pass away before one letter of his word fails. That's why I thank God for the word because David said his word is like a lamp to my feet and a light unto my pathway. Thank God for his word because Jesus said don't just be a hearer of the word but also be a doer of the word. That's why a lot of people said that we don't need to have a closet religion. We don't need to hide the God that we serve. We have to let the world know wherever we go that we got a mind to praise God. Is there anybody here that is glad to be a 24-7 Christian? I'm not just talking about on Sunday because many of us are Sunday saints, but weekday ain't. Some of us have got to realize that God is not wanting us to play with his word. Because playing with his word almost always all certainty invites the attacks of the enemy to come in so that when people know that we go to Mount Emmanuel, they laugh in our face. They laugh at our behind our backs in the calls. They do not take our witness seriously. And when you take your witness seriously, you will realize that not only is God always watching you, you also take it seriously that the enemy is watching you too. He's watching God bless you. He's watching God open up doors for you. He's watching God making waves out of no ways for you. And what he wants to do, he wants to customize your flood so there'll be just enough water to raise up all around you so that you will get discouraged, so that you will get depressed, so that you will get confused and you won't reach for that standard. But I'm here to tell somebody, no matter how high the waters may be, no matter how big the flood waters may be, you got to keep reaching for the standard. I touch your neighbor, if your neighbor is listening, say, neighbor, I don't care how bad bad it may be. I'm still reaching for the standard. That's why you got to be steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the word of the Lord. That's why he gives you his word, so that you will not lack direction, that you won't lack inspiration. You'll be willing to move forward and be steadfast, no matter what trouble comes your way. You will have a song in your spirit that says, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right. Jesus will fix it after a while. What I'm trying to tell you is, is you got to put on the whole armor of God. You can't come to the church half dress. Some of you last night, you laid out your dress. You laid out your blouse. You picked out your shoes. And you're erasing your accessories. But did you look at your word and say, when I get up in the morning, I got to have on my blessed bread of righteousness. I got to have on my belt of truth. I got to have on the feet or the sandals of the gospel of peace. I got on my helmet of salvation. I got on my shield of faith. But anybody here bring the word of God with them today. Keep bringing your Bible to church because when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will have to stand for something. And not only do you have to stand for something, you will have to stand on something. The word of God makes you a little bit taller. He makes you a little bit higher. And you got to be like Jacob's ladder and say every round goes higher and higher. I ain't scared of the devil because I got the word on my side. I got a sword in my hand and that word tells me that I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am a lender and not the borrower. I got on the whole armor of God. Somebody here is still sitting there saying, Reverend, you don't know the devil I'm dealing with. I sleep next to a devil every night. And I'm trying to get free. I'm trying to break free. But I don't know what's out there for me. And I got to tell you a story. There was an old mother in the church named Sister Sally. Sister Sally went to see her pastor. And she said, Pastor, I got a problem. I got two girl parents. And all they know how to say is, is well, we're hookers. Do you want to come home with us and have some fun? She said, Rep, I'm so embarrassed. Because that's all they can say. I pray for them every day. But all they say is that they're hookers. And then they need to have somebody come home with them so they can have a good time. And the pastor said, that's strange. I never heard any parents say something like that before. Don't you know, I got a solution. I got two male parents at my house, and I've taught them how to read the Bible and how to pray the Lord's Prayer. And I teach it to them every day. And why don't you bring your two girl parents, and I'll put them in there with my boy parents, and maybe they can give them the gospel so that they can be saved. And she said, that's a wonderful idea, Reverend. I'll bring them over there this afternoon. The next evening, the woman came by and she brought the two girl parents and she brought them to the preacher's house. And then, as she walked on in, she saw the two male parents. Their names were Francis and Joe. And they had on their holy and righteous faces. They had their Bibles open. And they were reading John 3.16. And then they were praying the Lord's Prayer. And so she took her two girl parents and she put them inside the cage with Francis and Joe. And very impressed, she saw them praying. And she saw them reading the word. And after a few minutes, uh, sure enough, uh, the, the girl still said, how are we two hookers? Uh, and we'd like to bring you home with us. Uh, and then the Francis and Job uh, looked at each other. Uh, and they waved their feathers in the air. Uh, and said, thank you, Lord, uh, for answering my prayers. Uh, Somebody here is just like Francis. Somebody here is just like Joe. We know how to be church and we know how to talk church while we in church. But as soon as the world comes in, 
as soon as the enemy comes in, we start talking like, and we start thinking like, and we start acting like the enemy. But I'm a living witness is that you can't let the devil ride. Because if you let him ride, he might want to drive. You've got to stand on the word. You've got to speak the word. But you also got to live the word. So that when you see the devil, you can put him on the run and say, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. I know I'm in a fight, but I'm not in this fight to lose. I'm on the winning side when Jesus on my side. I know I'm going to prosper when Jesus inside of me. I know that I'm blessed. If you know you're blessed, want to stand on your feet and say, I'm dressed for church. I got on the whole armor of God, and God is living in me. So I'm going to say his word with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, and all of my strength. Do you know him? Do you know him? Have you ever tried him? Is he your savior? Will you say yeah? Say yeah. Say yeah. Yeah, yeah. 